since all those publications, plus what WikiLeaks had uh, divulged before, there's been a whole discussion about them. Do, do you think this, uh, the impact of WikiLeaks has been exaggerated and people are just overestimating its impact, or do you think it's really something significant? I think there's been a lot of hype about this, um, and the WikiLeaks crowd want to persuade people that this is a revolution in communication which makes the mainstream media obsolete. I mean, this is completely exaggerated. Uh, what, what they have done is they had a very lucky break. They found somebody, a US soldier allegedly, who a junior one, who was prepared to leak an astonishing quantity of electronic information. And when you have these huge electronic databases compiled, uh, then they're going to come into existence and then inevitably they're going to be leaked. In that way, the world has changed. But the WikiLeaks operation, uh, with all its talk about cryptography and uh, anonymous document drops and so on, it is in some respects a bit of a, a fantasy by the, the, the world of geeks because the real strength of WikiLeaks isn't in all that. It's in the fact that it's, it's sort of uncensorable, that stuff that's put up on WikiLeaks can't really be stopped. And it's because it's across jurisdictions, national governments don't know of a way yet to stop it going up somewhere. Again, as we're, we're talking about, democratic societies confront this, uh, this tension between the need that every government obviously has to keep secrets and the desire of, of citizens to know more so that they can carry on their functions as citizens. Uh, do you think this WikiLeaks experience took that tension to extremes and, 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 and do you think the balance turned out right? Well, that tension is a fundamental component of a democratic society, as you say, and that tension is always going to be there. Obviously, the WikiLeaks theory that everything should be revealed uh, takes this to an extreme that's unsustainable. I mean, in a society, in a government, not everything can be revealed. And the fact that, for example, we want to keep back the, the names of individuals who might suffer reprisals uh, demonstrates that. Uh, what is also true is that as a journalist who's campaigned for freedom of information professionally for, you know, the whole of my own career, uh, I know very well that governments try and conceal more than they ought to and that we have to work hard at trying to expose uh, and make transparent as much as we possibly can. And there's no equality of arms in all this. The journalists are always going to be trailing far behind the government. People say, you know, I mean, I've often known journalists of my acquaintance who when they get into government, they become spokesmen or something. They say, I'm amazed to realize that as a journalist, I didn't know 5% of the truth of what was going on. And I think people should learn a lot more than 5%. On, on, on the legal aspect of that, um, you, of course, every organiza news organization has some, some legal limits as to what you can publish. But is it a fact, for the benefit of our viewers in Brazil, that the moment it's published, online, let's say, by WikiLeaks, you're rather protected legally to be able to uh, publish some facts that otherwise you wouldn't be able to? Is there a legal implication there? Well, it didn't work quite like that. In Britain, we have very tight libel laws, so there are limits on what we can publish. Um, however, because of the, this arrangement, WikiLeaks was able to publish online whatever it liked. Uh, not subject to libel law and of course our partners were able to publish whatever they liked subject to their own national laws so in the, U in the US for example they could publish a lot more in the New York Times because you know their libel laws are much looser than ours or much much more liberal uh, than ours uh, we so we were stuck with only publishing what we could publish but anybody who wanted could go go look at WikiLeaks for more details as we know, traditionally, um, the media depends a lot of um, material that is leaked by politicians, by civil servants, people f having internal fights, so mm. they wanted to, you know, we benefit from that throughout the ages. Does Wiki WikiLeaks add anything new to that? It adds quantity. Uh, in the past, we've been accustomed to, you know, a document or two being leaked. Uh, and Daniel Ellsberg, when he leaked the Pentagon Papers, uh, he says he spent literally months photocopying 7,000 pages uh, of this internal secret report. Uh, now that situation has been transformed, where you've got a database of 300 million words that can be leaked 
virtually at the press of a button. So the quantity does end up changing the quality after all. Yeah. I think so, yeah. You, you mentioned the Pentagon Papers. How would you compare the revelations, you know, the, the 1971, it affected the way uh, people saw the war in Vietnam. You think it has a similar impact? Well, <laughs> the interesting thing is that neither the Pentagon Papers nor the WikiLeaks have in fact changed anything. Uh, and we need to take that on board. Uh, Ellsberg thought that the Pentagon Papers would change the course of the war. They didn't, although I think in the long term, in the historical perspective, uh, people were able to see what was wrong with the war in Vietnam. Uh, so it was valuable, a valuable contribution to history, if you like. Um, as far as um, the WikiLeaks stuff goes, it hasn't stopped the war in Afghanistan. It hasn't stopped the, the situation in Iraq. It hasn't brought American diplomacy to, to a halt. Uh, apart from this slight contribution to the rebellions in, in Tunisia, you can't point to the world having been changed very dramatically by, what, by a year of a s sensational WikiLeaks disclosures. I think in the long term, again in history, you will see that people have become a lot more educated about the nature of these things and, and, and that's good. So you're not looking at dramatic overturnings, you're looking at um, an increase in the level of public uh, education. And if it starts with, as you say, with medical information, you can always expand to other things. Mm -hmm. and, and then information will leak. Mm. So I think it's quite dangerous the way huge databases are being compiled about all kinds of things at the moment. On the, on the, the diplomatic front, that we're dealing with the cable sent by, by the American diplomats, which is a massive amount of information there. Uh, former uh, Foreign Secretary David Miliband said that what happens is nowadays because of so much information coming from other sources, the 24 hour news, the internet and all that, diplomats are doing a different job from the old days. They used to provide, spend their time providing information that now you get through the media anyway. So they're turning their everyday work, their cable, much more personal. And therefore, that's what you find in WikiLeaks, because these guys are giving their personal opinions about things. So you see a shift there? Diplomats are behaving differently? Well, in a way, I don't have the data to tell you whether there's been a shift, because we have got a snapshot now of what American diplomacy has been like over the last few years. But, uh, or, uh, and we could compare it, I suppose, with material in the archives from 30 years back, uh, when you would see, I guess, that diplomats were doing much more factual reporting, yeah, because it wasn't, the facts weren't so easily available. You still see in the WikiLeaks cables uh, uh, quite a quantity of simple press reporting. You know, they will send back to Washington roundups of what the local media are saying. And the fact is, when it's filtered through uh, an individual, an educated individual diplomat's eyes, it's more valuable than, than plying through reams of the stuff yourself. You know, they are analysts. Um, I don't think that the role of the diplomat has disappeared. I don't think that's what this shows, but it does show that the role of the diplomat in an internet age, uh, when actually there's much more bilateral activity, you know, politicians want to talk to each other, they talk to each other, they don't need an ambassador as a, to, to mediate. Uh, that you can see the diplomat struggling to find a role, a useful role, and obviously uh, to be able to give a flavor of the country, to be able to give a flavor of the situation uh, in a way that somebody who is not actually living in it can't do, they see that as valuable. So you do see quite an emphasis on, on giving, uh, you know, giving a, a special flavor because they're trying, to, they're trying to show they're worth the money, I guess. Let's leave aside uh, Julian Assange for a while and, uh, and deal just with WikiLeaks in general. Uh, what many people don't realize when we're talking about it is that uh, the revelations that The Guardian and other uh, media outlets presented was not the raw material. There's a difference between what you put out and the raw material of WikiLeaks. Tell us about that difference. Mm, yeah, well, The Guardian published some of the cables and some of the uh, war logs from Iraq and Afghanistan that had been obtained by WikiLeaks. I suppose we did what professional media normally do, which is we looked at this stuff, 
and we decided what of it constituted a relevant story, what was fit to print, and that's what we put out. So what you saw with us was some really carefully selected news stories uh, and the accompanying cables. The, the ideology of WikiLeaks and the people who support it is completely different. Their ideology is to dump everything out, and then you have to persuade them that there's maybe some things they should redact or, or censor, as they would call it, such as, for example, the names of informants. And we had an, an argument with the WikiLeaks people uh, early on because they didn't really see why they should have to redact the names of informants. That's where, where the journalistic experience comes in. You know, you, you, know you have to do that. You've got to put it in proper context, right? Well, I think it's not just journalistic experience, it's common humanity, you know. We didn't want to publish stuff that would get people killed. And unfortunately, when we originally said this to Julian Assange, he said, well, you know, they're informants, they deserve to be killed. And we had <laughs> said, no, 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 you have to be educated about this, Julian. Even in terms of the reactions after the material was published, uh, uh, the editor of the New York Times says that their readers uh, complained that too much was revealed whereas some of the readers of The Guardian complained not enough was revealed. So that shows that there's a different editorial perspective on it. All the way through there was a different editorial perspective and that was quite interesting. Um, the difference between the, the New York Times and The Guardian, for example, emerged very early on when we did the uh, Afghan war logs. Uh, and that was the most sensitive area for The New York Times most probably because of course you know, it's the majority of their troops who are fighting a live war. Uh, and they were vulnerable to accusations of lack of patriotism, I suppose. We focused, and the European partners did too, very much on the civilian casualties that were caused in Afghanistan, and I think we were absolutely right to do so. Uh, New York Times focused much more on political points about uh, the way Pakistan wasn't pulling its weight or they were having altercations between the, the Pakistan intelligence agency and the Americans. So the New York Times was sort of, how could this war be better prosecuted? And we were all, this war is killing civilians, that's not good. Even when you're dealing with the, the third issues, as it, as it were, because like uh, talking about Russia, the, the Guardian headline, Virtual Mafia State, in referring to all the information you've gotten about it, and the bribery around Vladimir Putin. Whereas the, where the New York Times used the bland title, U.S. takes dim view of Russia. Quite a different emphasis, isn't it? Well, the New York Times was almost parodying its own reputation for understatement, whereas us, I'm afraid, well, our correspondent Luke Harding in Moscow got expelled as a result of the tough line we were taking. Sometimes these details are, are illuminating. Uh, we did find out about this American ambassador in Turkmenistan who said the president of the country does not like people who are smarter than he is. And then the ambassador writes, uh, since he's not a very bright guy, he's suspicious of a lot of people. That's very useful gossip, isn't it? You know? <laughs> well, one of the things those cables showed was actually the diplomats in the American State Department are often quite smart people and quite witty people who write very illuminating and often entertaining dispatches about the countries they're in that deserve a wider audience. Yeah, it is true that this ambassador was transferred to Siberia soon after that, but then I, have, I guess we've got to pay a price for this. And, uh, but then again, this trivia in the background also has a kind of in-house aspect of it. In your book, you describe uh, how your deputy editor, Ian Katz, almost ruined your whole WikiLeaks uh, scoop by sending all the material by mistake to a competitor, the political editor of the BBC. Tell us how that happened. Yes, well, Ian Katz does tell, tell that story. I think it's just because they had the, the similar name and he pressed the wrong button on his, um, it must have been on his Blackberry, I think. And th that's the story all the way through. And he tells a story as well about how he got very excited about all this spy stuff and uh, uh, bought a set of mobile thrones that you could phones that you could throw away uh, and then they all forgot the numbers so they never knew how to ring each other up so it was all stupid and in a way uh, that's quite entertaining that uh, you have this atmosphere of, of febrile espionage related excitement about uh, uh, a big leak like this and yeah. indeed the WikiLeaks people you know they're all very uh, they're all very keen on on paranoid secrecy they, they see themselves as secret agents and conspirators really. And in this case, the curiosity was that uh, your editor was sending the material to somebody, Nick Robinson of the BBC, who is the political editor there. It happens to, that, to be the same name as one of your staff here. Yeah, so he was sending the material somewhere else to a competitor. Right. 
the disadvantage that the, the print print press has normally. You you can't put everything there, but if it's online, people can always go there, and uh, and you can perhaps give the link from you know, the newspaper so that people go. Did you do that? Yeah, it's an interesting question about the link because the Guardian did link to WikiLeaks, yes, mm. but the New York Times, on the other hand, decided not to link to WikiLeaks because they said they were publishing some things they considered irresponsible. Their original redaction process wasn't very good, and they didn't want to be associated with them in that way. I think there was a little bit more to it than that as well. I think the New York Times didn't want to be seen to be endorsing what WikiLeaks were doing. They were kind of, you know, gathering up their skirts about that a little bit. Did you see the danger that the diplomats, as a result of all these revelations, will kind of hold back and now try to avoid saying much because they know it can end up in the pages of the Guardian? Well, <laughs> I, I, I remember looking through the National Archives in Britain for uh, the dispatches that have been released from ambassadors from 30 years ago, which is, you know, which is when they get released into the archives. And they, they send these very uh, pungent dispatches, actually, often, especially when they're leaving a post and they send a valedictory dispatch, in which they say some pretty brutal things about the country they've been condemned to spend the last few years in. I think the impulse to self-expression by these diplomats will override prudence in the end. Other than killing, and we didn't get that far, uh, there was a lot of action to suppress WikiLeaks, wasn't there? Well, they certainly tried to put the financial squeeze on them, and, and that, was, that was a bit alarming in a way, because you see a body that isn't exactly doing something illegal, or at any rate, something that can, they can be prosecuted for. And you see political pressure being put on financial institutions like uh, PayPal and MasterCard to stop dealing with WikiLeaks. It's understandable and inevitable, but it's a bit unconstitutional, I think. And worst of all, what you've seen is, is attacks on <laughs> the wretched junior soldier, Bradley Manning, who is accused of being the person who leaked all this material, who hacked into it and leaked it to... Uh, Assange and WikiLeaks. He's been arrested. He's been put in a military jail. He's being very brutally treated, I think. He's being kept in virtual solitary confinement. Uh, he's stripped of his clothes. Uh, currently, he's been stripped naked and made to parade naked. And, uh, and he ha he's kept in chains when visitors come. Uh, he's a little guy. He's only five foot two. Uh, this, is, this is the kind of brutish behavior which doesn't add to America's reputation. He hasn't even been tried or convicted of anything, this young man. And there's no evidence that he did what he did out of anything other than political belief. It may be misguided, but he's not like somebody who sold things for money. He's not like something who was working for a foreign power. He's not like a spy or a traitor. At worst, he's misguided. And at worst, all that's resulted from his behavior is embarrassment.